The last four years since sharing my story, Mary Claire, has been surreal. I think that for so long, having grown up um, in the identities that I grew up in, being trans, being brown, being a different kind of woman has kind of, I was taught to be ashamed and to be silent about my identities. And so to have opened up in such a public way about my story, um, I think I was surprised to kind of be able to be able to step more fully into my power, into the things that I want to do in life, and to be able to do that in the span that I've been able to do it in the last four years has been surreal, but also, I think, um, really fulfilling and affirming. I think for me, my passion and calling with all of the things going on, right, the idea of being a trans advocate, being a pop culture enthusiast, someone who has been trained as a journalist, um, being an author, a speaker, a TV host, all of that, I think the, the um, through line for me is storytelling. And so whatever platform and medium that comes in is not really relevant to me. Um, I think that what's probably been more challenging for me is this idea um, what probably has been more challenging for me is this idea of um, the labels, right? That someone who cares about and passionate about LGBT issues, um, trans liberation, you know, Black Lives Matter, millennial feminism, all of these things, that they can't um, do every single thing that they want to do. And so for me, and I think that it's some, something very specific to our generation is that we don't want to be burdened by labels, but we know that the labels and our identities are important, and so we don't necessarily want to hide them either. And so for me, having to work with, say, you know, bosses who are Gen Xers or baby boomers, they don't really understand that sense of like, how can this little brown trans girl from Hawaii um, who's open about her identities be able to show up on camera and people get this? And it's like, well, people get it because it's not necessarily completely relevant to the story, but it's there. My story is relevant to the fact that this is the space that I'm creating on TV, and this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about pop culture. I want to talk about how culture um, shows where we're at right now, where we need to go, the deeper meanings of it, that we can look at something that maybe seems shallow and silly like a music video, and like break it down and say what it, what it means about where we're at in our culture and our society. And so my passions are storytelling and I guess kind of finding the, the aha moments or the grains of truth within any kind of cultural facet or story that's kind of out there that we're taking in. Well, what's so bizarre about being trained as a journalist is that you kind of learn the myth of objectivity is if we all come in as journalists and ask people questions and don't necessarily have a perspective beforehand or any thoughts about it beforehand. And so for me for so long I thought that the only way to tell stories was to do so from a slant of I'm not putting myself in the story, I'm not putting my perspective in the story. And then after a while I got, you know, working at people at the time, people.com and writing about celebrities, I found myself kind of bored. I think I felt unchallenged. And I think if I was to say any kind of aha, it would have been around the idea of I'm bored of telling these stories. They don't necessarily matter to me anymore. They don't move me. Um, and I also have one of the most, you know, I have one of the most compelling and remarkable stories in a sense. And I was holding that in and hiding behind very famous people's stories. Um, and so the aha for me came in knowing that kind of that Toni Morrison um, quote of if there's a, I think it's if there's a book that you want to read and it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And so I knew that there was a story inside of me that I needed to tell and only I could write. And then I think that would then enable me to then write other people's stories and hopefully show up and be authentic and be fully myself in spaces, whether that's in television or whether that's in essays that I write for Mary Claire. Um, by me being authentic and being fully myself and vulnerable in public spaces, I think then it makes other people feel safe and vulnerable to show up as their most authentic selves. And so that would have been the whole shift for me being behind the story to going in front of the story and then kind of, in a sense, going back behind the story, but then have a, you know, and to challenge the idea of objectivity. It, it, it doesn't exist. I think for millennials, what's really important to us is the idea of being able to show up fully as who we are and do what we want to do. I think that there is, I think that 
so many of us have not only grown up with the internet, but we've grown up on the internet. And so having document in our lives and not really seeing it as documenting, but just as an extension of our lives, the internet and sharing of what we're going through as a part of our lives. And so that openness to share and be transparent about our experiences or even to editorialize our lives are a part of our professional, um, our professional lives. It's a part of all of that. And there's no separation between what the per professional is and what the personal is. And so I think that that has a lot to do with identities and boxes and challenging those things and shattering this idea of, you know, the professional you perform this way and then in the personal you perform that way. I think for millennials, it's, it's going to be very fluid. It's going to be transparency. And I think that transparency and authenticity is very core to, uh, to all of us being able to, um, as a generation, to show up as ourselves and is a part of our success, is being able to go to a job and then you know, tweet ourselves twerking on Vine and then be able to go back to that job and not be checked on that, that that's a part of who we are. It's all of us, right? And so I think that that sense of transparency is really integral to um, any kind of success that we feel that we could accomplish. For so long in my life, I've had to do things on my own. That's kind of the way that I was raised. I was raised that you, you make a way for yourself, you plot ahead, um, you, you work twice as hard, you have to be twice as good in order to have any kind of access or semblance of success. And so for me, a lot of that didn't really often include asking people for help. And so I will say that in my lifetime, I've, so far, in much of my career, I have not had mentors. There has been, there has been really great people who believed in me and supported me and opened doors in certain situations. But in way, I wouldn't say there was anyone that I went up to to ask for guidance on things. Um, a lot of it has been my own kind of navigating certain systems and being kind of strategic about it and fierce about it and a little bold and a little ballsy at times. There's definitely like, I can definitely say there's key moments and key people in my life where things happen. I think about Kierna Mayo, um, who wrote the first piece about me and Mary Claire. That was someone who saw something in me and was like, let's collaborate and make this happen. Um, I think about um, my friend Alicia Menendez who was one of the first people that I went to when I thought about going into TV and those offers were kind of coming and she's been someone who's behind the scenes kind of saying, and we're the same age, who, who's, kind of, who's kind of been like, well, I'll show you the way of how I've been able to navigate this through my career at Huffington Post Live and Fusion and all of this stuff. And so I feel like that's a very millennial way of, is that our peers are often the ones who kind of help us oftentimes the most. Um, I think about, there's this woman named Catherine Pino who um, was the one who got me on to The Outlist, which was this HBO documentary. And now I'm creating a documentary with that same team of people called The Trans List for HBO, um, interviewing a lot of trans luminaries and legends and artists and all that stuff. Um, so there's definitely like key people who've kind of been able, you know, just been like, here's a little, you know, some pixie dust to kind of let, help you go to the next, to the next level of what you want to do. Um, but mentor, like I'm trying to think of like one, some people in my, some key professional, professionals who've helped me along the way and there hasn't. And I don't, and I think that there's, I know that one thing as someone who now is becoming someone that people want to mentor them, <laughs> um, I think that one key advice I would say is not necessarily to look for someone that you can build a relationship with, but look for someone who you can ask a very simple question to, who can reply to an email very easily to you. So what is it that you need? Don't look so much on, let's sit down and have coffee or let's, you know, let's um, have a cocktail, but, but what is the one thing that you need this particular person that you're seeking mentor, a mentor from to actually guide you through? Because I think that's what has help, helped me a lot is when there's a certain question that I have and I, I kind of point it to the right person that I know who can actually answer it. And it takes the pressure off of the person who's being asked. Like, if you have to think about scheduling a coffee date with someone, you know, it's a lot. So it's like, it, but it, I can answer a one question email and feel fulfilled, like, and feel useful as a mentor in that sense without having to take on the struggle of like being 
a full-on mentor and the, the responsibilities and duties that kind of come with the, the title of that. What I would tell my 21-year-old self if we were sitting down for some cocktails. I think I would tell her the number one thing would be don't believe the hype of the dream. I would say that, you know, at 21 I was moving to New York City um, to attend grad school at NYU for journalism. And I was really excited about um, being able to chase after the visions that I have of what New York would provide for me. Um, I was very much chasing after Carrie Bradshaw's dream. <laughs> Having basically spent, you know, my young, my late teens and early 20s kind of fantasizing about living her life. And so I wanted to write for a magazine. I wanted to have some sick fashions. I wanted to have, like, girlfriends and have brunch and kiss boys on St. Mark Street and, like, all of this stuff. And I was able to do that. But once I got there and I accomplished uh, so many of the things that I thought were my dream things, right? My dream apartment, my dream job. Um, it wasn't fulfilling. Um, and so I would tell her, don't believe the hype, but this is a part of the process for you to get to what your vision is for your life. And so, yeah, that's what I would say. I would say, don't believe the hype.